And what is extraordinary is that none of this is necessary anyway, because three years ago, I began to smell a rat when I couldn't find anywhere in these enormous documents of the UN any mention of how to convert the radiative forcing from carbon dioxide in watts per square meter into temperature change. Now, this was a puzzling omission because the only scientific question that really matters in this debate is the question how much warming a given proportionate increase in carbon dioxide concentration will actually cause. I searched the entire 2001 and 2007 reports of the UN's turgid climate panel, all 2,500 pages of waffle, the search term Stefan Boltzmann, for that is the name of the fundamental equation of radiative transfer, did not appear once in either of these two documents. And this was strange because in that number of pages there was certainly space to try to explain this to people whom they are trying to convince that they've got things right. So it was and is a startling omission. And here is why they didn't want you to know about this fundamental equation. Now, on this entirely simple and self-explanatory slide, <laughs> we start with the data. The green data are actual measured data for temperature, CO2, and incoming solar radiance. The black data are me saying we're going to look at what happens if you have no CO2 in the atmosphere and what we're going to have twice today's CO2 in the atmosphere. The blue data are data directly related to and derivable from the Stefan Boltzmann radiative equation. So we now come down to the equation itself. And what it tells us is that if, and this is a modest experiment I've done here, I have removed the entire atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. I've taken it all away and left the Earth a bare rock and then I've worked out, using this equation, how much cooler it would be then. And it would be 9.3 degrees Kelvin cooler, not the 34 degrees you usually hear about. They make the mistake of assuming that if you take away the atmosphere, for instance, the clouds will still be left to reflect the sunlight back into space. Well, hello, they won't. <laughs> so the answer is 9.3, and that's all. Now, we then go to a paper by one of the, bedwet, um, one of the uh, eminent scientists on the IPCC uh, who tells us that 27% of all the warming caused by the atmosphere being there rather than not being there is caused by CO2. So that's 2.5 Celsius degrees of warming has been caused by CO2 from the moment when time began until today. That is all. Now, we then have to know how many watts per square meter does that represent. So we use equation number one in the middle there. That's from James Hansen, uh, repeated in the IPCC's 2007 document. And what it shows is 24 watts per square meter of radiative forcing produces 2.5 degrees Celsius of warming. And that gives you a climate sensitivity parameter of 0.1 Kelvin per watt per square meter, rather than the 0.9, which is the IPCC's central estimate. Now, let's try to prove this result. Let's try to test it a little. The top result is our best estimate. That's the 0.1 figure, which gives you a warming in Celsius of 0.4, in Fahrenheit 0.7. The UN is at the bottom in red there, 3.3 Celsius for a doubling. And in between, I've done a couple of experiments. I've assumed that, uh, for instance, we take CO2 to have caused half of all the warming. And even then, it's still a tiny fraction of the UN's climate sensitivity figure. Or you can ignore the first 50 parts per million and take uh, Dick Lindzen's uniform atmosphere from then on, and even that, 0.9 compared with 3.3. Or you can take both of those together, 1.6. So whichever way you press the numbers, trying to shoot down our own mathematical proof, you find that climate sensitivity is definitely no, low. Now, we're going to run this argument past some of the scientists here over the next few weeks to find out whether we're right or whether we're right. And we think we're right. And we hope to get this published. And if it is published, that will be the end of the debate. So now I want to end 
by saying that as the Copenhagen Climate Summit approaches, the ambition and interests of the bureaucratic centralists of the UN, the shadowy commissars who are the dictators of the EU, the energy imperialists of Russia, the military industrial complex of China, and the scientific technological elite here in the US, against which President Eisenhower gave such strong warnings in his farewell address, will fatefully, and perhaps fatally, coincide. Whether or not any binding but pointless targets for curbing CO2 emissions are decided upon at Copenhagen, one policy they will all agree upon. The UN's climate panel will be given new powers, at first merely powers of monitoring, but increasingly powers of intervention, taxation, and legislation. As Maurice Strong, Jack Chirac, and their ilk had always intended, the IPCC will emerge after Copenhagen as the prototype and nucleus of a world government. We have already seen this in the EU. We have learnt the hard way that supranational government is never democratic government, nor is it honest, nor is it cheap. Yet the <laughs> highly placed conspirators who seek to ride the climate scare to world domination have reckoned without one thing. You. You are here, and you have not let the truth go, and you will not let the truth go. Thanks to you, it is becoming evident that the rent-seeking promoters of this great boondoggle, through the very scientific ignorance that they had sought to exploit in others, have merely deluded themselves. In the end, it will be here, in the United States, that the truth will first emerge in all its glory. Not in Europe, for we are no longer free. Not in Russia or China, for they have never been free. Not in the Middle East, for while militant Islam endures, it can never become free. It is here, in your great nation, a nation founded upon liberty, that the battle for the world's freedom will be won. It is you, whose forefathers fought against ours for their freedom, whose fathers and grandfathers fought shoulder to shoulder with ours for Europe's freedom, and whose gallant sons and daughters now fight alongside ours for the world's freedom, it is you, the people of the United States, who will surely lead and inspire the world once more in this dark hour that might, but for you, have become a new dark age. You must not and you shall not fail. Therefore, I end with the words of your poet Longfellow, addressed by Sir Winston Churchill to your president during the Second World War, during the darkest hour before the dawn. Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. Thank you.